didn't think we'd be here again introducing a wide receivers coach, but uh, it is what it is. The previous receivers coach made a decision that he felt was best for his family. Uh, we collected the $450,000, then some that we were owed uh, for vo uh, violating or leaving his contract. And then it allowed us to go out and hire an even better wide receivers coach in my mind. And, and that's not a knock on anybody, but that's what I feel about this guy right here that that uh, the first time around didn't talk to him just because I knew kind of what I wanted to do with the position with some of the staff shuffling that I did after the season. And um, uh, that's what I did previously. But now that we had an actual search for a wide receivers coach, um, that was a, it was a great opportunity to bring someone in to make us better. And again, some of my uh, the things that I want, and I think I may have mentioned this in the previous press conference, but just looking at our wide receiver group as a whole, want, wanted to get someone in here that can develop our guys a little bit better than what we have. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at who we were playing receiver with last season, it's guys that we inherited um, that uh, that were here when I got here as the head coach for the most part, uh, or transfers that we had brought in, had been a little disappointed. And again, it starts with me as the head coach, had been a little disappointed with the freshmen that we've brought into our program that we recruited and their development. You know, obviously Nick Harbor played a lot for us last season, but beyond Nick, there really hasn't been one in the last three seasons. And uh, that can't continue. We've got to be able to recruit our guys and then develop them when they get here. And uh, confident that Mike Furry will do that for us. And then we got to be more consistent as a receiver group. Uh, too many drops last season in critical situations. And again, that starts with me as the head coach. And it's, but we just need to be more consistent and, um, and be a little bit better there from a development standpoint and recruiting standpoint. That's what I was looking for. And I feel like we've hit a home run with who we've brought in uh, with him. All right, guys, welcome in GC Live Friday episode of the show. Rainy Friday here in Columbia, South Carolina. Not the way we wanted to start what should be an awesome weekend, hopefully in Columbia. Hopefully this will clear up later on. We'll see about baseball tonight. Still no announcement last I checked as we are here live. But, of course, I'm Wes Mitchell. He is Chris Clark. This show brought to you, as always, by Clint Hammond. Movement Mortgage, clinthammond.com, 803-771-6933. Like we always tell you, if you're in the market to buy a home or you're just considering buying a home, call Clint today. He'll help walk you through what options you may have, what the interest rates look like, all types of mechanisms you can kind of get creative with to try and get you in that dream home. And uh, again, Clint will walk you through that and then probably give you his opinion on Shane Beamer and the Mike Fury hire as well. So um, that, that's what we're talking about here today. Of course, earlier this morning, Beamer announcing, introducing his new wide receivers coach. You heard that clip there momentarily. That was a kind of opening statement or part of the opening statement there from Beamer as he talked about really, Chris, not just the hire, but kind of what happened leading up to the hire, how the hire took place. And, of course, no love loss there, it sounds like, with the way – things kind of played out with James Coley leaving shortly after arriving at South Carolina. Yeah. I mean, man, Beamer, Shane Beamer wears his emotions on his sleeve, right? As we all know. And he's a guy that I think one of the qualities that endeared him to South Carolina fans who, you know, even going back to 2020, December, 2020, if you heard a South Carolina fan say that they wanted Shane Beamer to get the job, what, what was, one of the biggest reasons, right? Like he's a Gamecock. He's been here and he knows the place and he loves the place. And this was a job that was represented a dream job scenario to him. And so I say that to point out that he has a lot of pride about this place. And when someone basically takes a look around and says, you know, this, this place isn't good enough for me or this place isn't right for me, you know, Beamer, doesn't always take kindly to that, you know, and um, there was a, a more personal aspect to this one, I think, Wes, because you pointed this out earlier on the game, you know, James Coley 
worked with Beamer at Georgia for two seasons. They they know each other. He's going to a school that, you know, yeah, you don't play Georgia in 2024 if you're South Carolina, but but you always did in the past. That's a school that's kind of one of your rivals, right? And and Shane Beamer knows Kirby Smart. They they know each other well. They have a history together. And so th- this one a little bit more personal, a little bit more different than just somebody else you leaving your school in the manner in which it was done, obviously. You, you pointed out, I think, last week, hey, if a guy leaves after a year, two years, okay. But he left very soon after he got here, so a little different there. But, but I thought, Wes, also, you know, Beamer's explanation going into depth, like you said, about how this took place, you know, where he was when he found out, but also the thought process going in as far as what he was looking for. And he even dove in a little bit more kind of behind the curtain on, you know, exactly why he made some shifts this offseason to try to fix the receiver position. Yeah, he did. I, I thought he dove much more into that or, or provided some more detail on that now than maybe he did before, obviously, with the decision to to move step to tight ends and to bring in Coley in the first place. And it, it sounds like, based on Beamer's indication, a big part of that has been in a big, as we kind of bring this forward, I, I don't want it to get all about the past, but I, I think it's worth talking about because it affects probably Beamer's goals for this position moving forward, his goals for – um, what he wants to see from Fury would be development of your guys who are recruited out of high school. And that, that was one thing Beamer, and he did say, hey, it starts with me. You know, I, I think he's always, he always tries to throw that part in there. Hey, it starts at the top as the head coach, but then does it trickle down? Uh, of course, that, that's how this stuff works. And so just something that, hey, like le- yet, you inherited juice Wells was a transfer guy. And and I think maybe even if you really want to start to read into it, Chris goes back to maybe an overall point and something we've said about the program, even as the transfer portal has become more and more of a factor in college athletics, this isn't just wide receivers. Most of your positions, you want to build your foundation by recruiting and developing high school guys. And, you know, I the fact Beamer brought that up, pointed it out, he was not asked for that specifically. Um, he had it on his mind, and he wanted to share it. And, and so to me, I mean, go look, the, the guys they brought in this year, DeBron Gatling, Mazio Bennett, wanting to put them in a position to be developed and, and be ready to make an impact. And then moving forward, um, as we sort of see – what guys we already kind of know what that board looks like. I'm sure the board will shift a little bit again. That's always the case with a new coach, but was not by accident that Shane Beamer mentioned wanting to put, wanting to land and then develop high school guys who can make an impact um, and potentially make an impact early in their career at South Carolina. I think the the more I thought about this, I, I literally just thought about, this particular thing in the past, I don't know, two minutes while you were talking, Wes, the, I think the Clemson game really was kind of the, the end cap into some things that we had seen either most of the year or towards the end of the year that kind of really solidified what Shane Beamer was thinking. Remember when you, you and I sat down with him, he said after five games when this team was two and three, he called some of the veteran players one by one into his office and, hey, what's gone wrong? How can we fix this? He admitted, hey, I was more cognizant of the fact that we needed changes than the other years. Now, one reason for that, obviously, Wes, year one and year two, you're outperforming expectations. You're you're winning six games. It's not like you're winning a championship, right? But you are outperforming expectations to win six games year one, to win eight games year two. That's better than anybody thought the way you ended 2022 beating Tennessee and Clemson didn't really fit with the, oh, well, let's blow everything up, you know, because things were going, seemed to be on the right track. Well, year three, things slipped back. Now you look at the Clemson game and then look at the changes that Beamer did or didn't make. Defensively, you didn't give up an offensive touchdown, right? 
Beamer was much more satisfied with how the defense played down the stretch, doesn't end up making any on-field staff tweaks, although there internally are some things changing. You look at the fact that South Carolina still struggled to run the ball last season. Mario Anderson was a revelation, but you struggled with running back production. He ends up making a change there. The other change was at receiver, and he laid out a compelling case for it in his press conference. But if you look at the Clemson game, one of the things we talked about there was when Xavier Leggett wasn't on the field, obviously you didn't have juice. When you looked at the personnel out there, to Beamer's point, they were guys that South Carolina had largely inherited, with the exception of Nick Carver playing as a true freshman who had never played the position before college. So I think seeing that and the results, that kind of just drove home that point that, hey, this is an area where we can do better. And clearly he he walked away thinking that after the season was was finished. Yeah, and I, I think, dude, to, to build depth, you have to recruit and develop high school guys. And I, I think that Clemson game really sort of ate into and then exposed some of that depth in that, that there's always going to be a drop-off almost anywhere because there's a reason that if you're talking about receiver generally it's three positions on the field it's a reason those three guys are playing first it's a reason they earn the chance to go play but I think once you start having injuries and then you see man the next group just isn't quite at the same spot and then the group after that you know you're talking about walk-ons or former walk-ons I think that's probably to your point a little bit where Beamer's kind of leading or leaning with that without really truly coming out and specifically saying that. And so now you've got, I mean, that position is kind of in transition right now, right? Once again, you went the portal route, but I, I think again, looking at the two guys, Maisie Bennett, someone who obviously they talked about it in the press conference already very familiar with Mike Furry. And so he comes in, and uh, he's going to inherit a couple of freshman guys that I, I think will have every opportunity to play in 2024. And you're going to have the trio of transfers. I'm sure we've talked about this for many, many minutes. I'm sure they will try to add maybe another guy or two in the next portal window. So that part is a, a factor. But then I think big picture and even – you know what, Chris, if you're going to develop high school guys into long-term players, you can't do that by having a guy who is going to just show up and leave after, you know, I'm not even talking about after 45 days, after one year, honestly, you know, like, yeah. and, and one of one of our commenters made, I think, a pretty good point earlier this week. I made the statement, Coley has stuck around at some places he's been. And really what I should have said was in comparison to being there for a month and a half, like he's really <laughs> to the, the commenters yeah. point, like they were correct. He really hasn't stuck anywhere for like at a really extended period of time, which assistance that's kind of par for the course, but his average time, probably a little bit lower than most. So I, I do wonder how much, especially after having it, you just dealt with it over the weekend. You were on vacation and you find out this guy's leaving for one of your SEC rivals. And I wonder how much, hey, like let's get a guy who obviously they're high on, but might stick around for three or four or five years and – try to actually go through the process of developing a, a high school guy. Cause that, that's the other part. If you're, if you're going to develop a guy who is starting a little bit more raw as a high school guy, it's going to take time to develop them. Yeah. Almost like building a, you know, building the room basically. Right. I mean, you, you think of the football program and all these different areas, you're, you're building a strength and conditioning program. The head coach is responsible, and everybody in the building, right? But but building the culture and setting the culture is something Shane Beamer talks about probably even more than a lot of head coaches. And then each assistant responsible for building his room, right? And, I mean, at, at the end of the day, Wes, I think, look, adding talent to your room and to your football program, that's that's the best way to, for lack of a better term, to get good. I mean – 
adding talent, right? But I do agree with you that you can kind of see from last season, and not even just last season, there were some hints, some 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 cracks that kind of exposed this, I think, before, but particularly at the receiver room, yeah, you can recruit a really good transfer like a Juice Wells, right? But even when they had Juice Wells out there in 2022 and Jalen Brooks and Josh Van and those guys before Xavier Leggett's breakout season, you know, you're still going, all right, who who's the next crop up? And you kind of worried about that going into 2023. And, yeah, XL had a huge breakout season. Super happy for him. Great year. But behind him, you could see the deficiencies, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I anticipate South Carolina is going to continue in the year 2024 and beyond as long as it's a thing. Yeah, they're going to work the transfer portal probably for receivers. But you do have to have the development of the high school wideouts, the, the best programs in the country. They have some transfer receivers, but they've also got guys that they've had and that have stuck around and developed or been really highly rated freshmen as well. Yeah, I think ideally it's going to be a mix. You want to be able to have that as an option to maybe plug a hole here, plug a hole there. But for the most part, you want to kind of build out that depth chart. Um, in theory, you hope, via the high school ranks. So we'll see if South Carolina can do that moving forward. Right now, a dead period as far as recruiting goes. Again, that's a bit of a misnomer. If South Carolina wants to get prospects on the phone, you can still talk to guys on the phone. So I imagine in the next 24 hours, maybe it's happened already, we're going to be hearing how the, you know, Malik Clark, kid from Rock Hill, probably their top local 2025 target. I'm sure he'll be talking to to um, Furry, if not already. And, uh, you know, you're going to start hearing about other guys who have heard from him as well, I would imagine. So. Dead period means South Carolina can't go see the prospect. The prospect can't come to campus right now. But, again, you can still talk to them on the phone, and that process will start. And then once spring gets here, you'll start to see guys back on campus again in a couple of weeks. So I've got several clips. So you already heard one. I've got three more. One more from Beamer, two more from um, Furry himself. And so this one's a little bit shorter. I, I did think it was important to play that first one because I thought it kind of summarized a lot of what's happened from Beamer's perspective. Now, this one dives a little bit more into just Furry himself and the hire and what Beamer kind of expects from that position. He uh, was uh, That hire was approved by our board yesterday morning, and he had a meeting with his team yesterday, and he was here in the building and already at work with our players on the field within five minutes of being in Columbia. Um, showed up here. We didn't. We didn't even let the guy change clothes. He walked in the building immediately. Went to a special teams meeting, and then we walked out on the field. And um, we just had a little workout going on with our players. And he and I were standing on the sidelines talking, just kind of pointing out who different guys are. I walked over to the defensive field, told him just kind of make himself at home and and get acclimated. Walk back about ten minutes later, and he's already out there in in street clothes out on the field working with our receivers. So I feel confident in saying that he's been here less – he's been here 24 hours and he's made our group better already. Uh, Going to be a great recruiter for us, great addition to our program, and couldn't be more excited about Mike Furry being our new wide receivers coach and his family being here also. Again, like I said, we'll have a couple more uh, clips there, two of them from Furry himself. But, Chris, as we've kind of asked around and, and started to dive into this hire and try to get an idea – of what maybe playing style or coaching style he has, kind of the his MO, I, I guess. One word or one idea that keeps coming up from people I've talked to is just that he's going to bring an edge to the room. And, uh, you know, I, I think high energy, he's been compared a little bit, obviously completely different background, but just from an on-field and on-the-practice-field personality, there are some Sean Elliott, comparisons here I think that probably resonates with South Carolina fans who obviously are very familiar with Sean Elliott's coaching style and but yeah that word edge high energy those are the things that keep popping up when I hit when I've asked people about him and I, I think you'll probably hear that if you're listening if you didn't watch the press conference earlier I would encourage you to go watch and listen the whole thing again we just got some clips here but that kind of starts to shine through a little bit even in this press conference setting when he talks about 
for one, just his excitement for being at South Carolina, but two, his um, passion, which was another word I've heard for diving in and working with these guys who are on campus. Yeah, and Shane Beamer in a, in a clip that I don't think we will play, Wes, you know, mentioned how, you know, Mike Furry's son is uh, a defensive back at Gaffney High and, you know, took his son to camp last year. So those two got to meet each other. Um, Beamer actually didn't detail, like, unless I missed it, Wes, I called Mike or Mike called me. I, I don't honestly know the genesis of it. But however it happened, Beamer had him in the back of his mind. Okay, Mike Furry. And then I, I think Beamer just really liked from what he said, that passion, like you said, the the resume and the track record. I think he feels like there are some ingredients there, and we'll dive into this. The, the necessary ingredients to be a good recruiter are there. And then when you look at this guy, you know, he's been a head coach at two different places, and he's pretty pretty drastically improved those programs at both spots as a head coach. And then there's that, as something you said earlier, that want to and that desire to be here. And for a head coach like Shane Beamer, that matters. And then especially when viewed in the light of what just happened with a coach leaving you after, you know, a month or so. So um, obviously had a lot of traits as they taught that he really liked. And, and it, in fact, I remember Beamer saying during the presser, there's no need to talk to anybody else. It, that's not the only person he talked to, but once he talked to Furry, had the extensive conversation with him, hey, th this is this is my guy. This is the best guy. Yeah, and I, I think, um, again, I don't know for a fact who reached out to who. Asking around some, I, I mean, I was kind of given the impression that it was Beamer sought him out. And I, I think, again, this is what I was told by actually two different people. I think leaving Limestone with what they were trying to build there like it, it was a decision for Furry and his family. Like I, I was told that basically he felt like there was unfinished business there and he was very happy about kind of the direction they had it going and sort of making another move. What was a decision that was not made lightly, but being an SEC receivers coach and, you know, kind of coaching at this level here in South Carolina, just, what was too much to turn down, but I, I do think this was a thing where it sounds like South Carolina very much pursued him and, and really, I mean, you know, Chris, it was quiet to give people a little bit of kind of background. It was very quiet. And then we heard his name and then I, I will say this, I didn't hear a single other name involved in this search where the information was, hey, this is a guy Beamer is targeting. Yeah. You know, with him, when um, when was that? Tuesday morning, I think we were at radio show. I think it was Tuesday morning. And um, we heard the name. Up until that point, we had heard some names, but it was more, hey, this guy is very interested in the job. And there, there's always that there's two sides to it. Always you start hearing, Hey, these guys are interested. Sometimes there's overlap. And one of those guys ends up being the higher other times. And it's the hardest thing to trace down in our business is who does that coach actually want to go higher? Because it's a much smaller circle of people know that information. And so we did finally hear that name Tuesday and that was really the only name I ever heard as far as being a major target for Shane Beamer. And so I, I can't say for 100% fact that he was really the only guy they really, truly pursued hard, but it, it certainly seems like um, he was one of their top guys here. And let, you know what, Chris, let's go ahead. Let's go out. I've got these two other clips. I want to spread them out throughout the podcast. This is, I did, I skipped over the stuff, uh, Furry thanked, you know, everybody, his wife, Beamer, administration, all that. I skipped that part, but this is him talking about that visit you were talking about with his son and sort of I took that as really being his first exposure to the South Carolina program, his first sort of inside look at, at what this place has in terms of resources and what Shane Beamer is all about. And in my opinion, it kind of sounded like 
that left a impression on him. So here he is talking about that. Right. He's right. Uh, just last summer, uh, I had a chance to bring my son Stone down here to a uh, junior, to a uh, high school camp. And uh, it was my first time here. It was my first time to experience uh, everything here at South Carolina, facilities, the resources, uh, the coaching staff. And as you guys know, in general, uh, Coach Beamer and Dow Loggins. And I've known Dow for a long time. Uh, we never really crossed paths in, re in regards to uh, being in the same room together and, and, and working together. But we've had a bunch of relationships uh, through, and friendships through people that, uh, we, that we are both close with uh, that have always spoke so highly about, uh, about him and, and uh, how he works and what I've found and what I've realized over the last 48, day, or 48 hours or so is that they're right. And, uh, but I, I will tell you this, um, there was a moment last summer while I was here uh, speaking with Coach Beamer. And, you know, in this profession, I've learned, you know, one of the values and in, in, in one of the ways to be successful as a coach, especially an assistant coach, is to surround yourself with the good people, right? People that have, that are high character, they're passionate, uh, they're on a mission to success. And I think one of the things that I felt connected with the most was, uh, Coach Beamer's passion to make an impact in the youth and the kids that he's around. And that's something that I have strived on in my coaching career to basically put at the forefront to build programs because I believe in that. And, uh, and I was highly, highly, uh, uh, I just, from that moment when I left, I just, I had so much respect for him and became a Gamecock fan uh, and was hoping that, you know, obviously he would be successful and, and followed his, you know, followed the Gamecocks a little bit more than normal. All right, yeah, so that's him talking about kind of that first experience with uh, just with the South Carolina program and being on campus and, and all that. Um, I, I, the final clip that I got, we'll play here in a minute, is just him talking about his expectations for the position group. But, you know, Chris, other than what we already knew and what we had gathered in terms of information about him as far as his coaching style and what he's all about, anything that we haven't talked about that just kind of has caught your attention after listening to both him and Shane Beamer talk today? Muted. Haven't done that in a while, Wes. You know, I keep going back to – in, in two different positions and two different hires, two different people. But when Beamer hired Sterling Lucas, the question was, all right, this is a dude that has only been in the NFL. Like Sterling Lucas was, I think he worked in the weight room and then he was a graduate assistant at NC State, his alma mater. Right after that, he jumped in the NFL and was there for several years. Then Beamer hired him and Beamer admitted to us more than once, Wes, like, Sometimes, man, when you hire the NFL type of guy, you don't really know what you're going to get from a recruiting standpoint. But in Sterling, he thought that Sterling had all the traits, and that has certainly played out. Like, he's been arguably South Carolina's best recruiter. Well, this was interesting because we know that Beamer talked a lot about development, and I think he's right. Another part of that is recruiting. You know, I, I think the reason that he made – a change and, and shifted some things at receiver and initially brought in James Coley was development and recruiting and feeling like, you know, this program could upgrade in that department. So when you look at furry, there's been a lot of talk about development, but the recruiting piece will be obviously critical. And so I think it's fair to say, Hey, that's a question mark because we, we can't look up and down a list of here. Are all the recruits Mike furry has signed at the SEC level, the power four level, right? We, we don't have that, um, but he's got a unique resume, right? He's been a receiver coach with the Bears. He's been a head coach uh, a couple different or at a couple different schools three different times, right? And um, he's got a really interesting background. But I think after listening to him, I think you can put together, okay, this guy's got some of the traits – that it, it would take to be a good recruiter, right? He's he's well-spoken, articulate. I think he does have that edge. He's got a personality. And then, obviously, he can lean on that background. And I think he can speak intelligently about that background and how he can help develop players, which is a big part of it. Now, there's a lot of other aspects 
in 2024 to recruiting players, Wes. NIL is a huge one, right? So there's some questions to be answered, but that was one. I just wanted to hear from Furry to be able to kind of gather and form an opinion on, okay, could this guy have some of the traits it takes to be an effective recruiter? Because that'll that'll be important. Yeah, and I think, like you said, resources slash NIL, always very, very important right now. And so that, that's going to be part of it. But in, in a lot of ways, I, I think, you know, you can go – a number of different directions with hiring coaches. And to me, again, you want to mix on your staff with, with Coley. It was definitely the, it, it was definitely kind of the must champ era type hire. It felt like in that you look at this resume and you say, man, this guy's been at this, like you said, power four, which is hard for me to accept power four school here, the sec, sec, acc, sec. And so you kind of start going down the resume and you're like, man, this guy, you can do exactly what you said. You can pull up that 24-7 sports all-time commits and be like, dang, this guy got three five-stars and ten four-stars, and you can let yourself get pumped up about that, and 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 rightfully so. And I, I think those guys, part of it is, can, can you keep them? Can you keep them on campus? And then, But I, I think, to, to use your same example, if when South Carolina hired Sterling Lucas, if if I said we'd be sitting here talking about Dylan Stewart being a five-star freshman on South Carolina's campus right now, Des, you, a four-star guy from the last cycle, if I told you that Sterling Lucas was going to be landing guys like that, first of all, I would say that's far exceeding expectations that you would put on a new coach. Yep. You know, And second of all, I would say nobody should be worried about his recruiting at all. And so it's not an exact science. And, you know, frankly, there's been guys that have the recruiting resume that have come to South Carolina and it they haven't gotten the players I maybe thought they would. And then there's been guys who come in with not much of a recruiting resume or it's kind of like, I don't know, when you don't have credit yet because you just don't have credit yet. You know, like you, you have to build it. And so Sterling Lucas had been – he's an NFL guy. So he hadn't had the chance to show he was a great recruiter yet. He comes in and just does it. So I, I think ultimately we talk about this all the time. Other than the NIL aspect, which of course is part of it, recruiting, it's about want to. It's about being able to build relationships. And then I, I think – once you add in that aspect, does it help to have some other little things? And to me, for for Mike Fury, the other thing is going to be, hey, dudes, I played in the NFL as an undrafted free agent. I was the leader in receivers in the NFC one season. And I coached in the NFL for four seasons. So I, I think that that is a resume you can recruit to that I, I think will be valuable for South Carolina. Well, and, and uh, we I've talked about a recruiting a lot, but to go back to the development piece, I think that resume gives Mike Furry credit um, and, and it gives him cachet when he's talking to his current guys about development too. Because, I mean, anybody who, played, who has played sports and, and Wes – I know you won't mind me saying neither of us have played sports at a high, high level, right? I'll, I, you were a better ball player than I was back in the day. Neither of us played college ball. We certainly didn't play in the pros. But we both had that coach, right? You know, we've both we've both had – and anybody who has sports experience knows this at, at any level. Like, things about sports are not easy all the time. Like, the practices – the coaching, hearing things that you don't want to hear, doing things you don't want to do. That's certainly the case in college where guys are under pressure, players are under pressure, coaches are under pressure. It's, it's serious stuff. And so when you know Mike Furry is going to change, I don't know how he's going to change things exactly. I don't know exactly what his expectations for guys are going to be, but they'll be different than they were in the past. He'll have his own method and process. And some of the things are probably not going to be all that fun for the guys. But he can point to, hey, 
this is what helped me get to the league. Isn't that what you want to do? Because everybody coming into a college football program, almost everybody, believes firmly that, hey, they can go play at the next level. Most of them do not. But, you know, I think that helps you from a development standpoint, not only teaching them, right, but getting them to buy in and believe in that process is an important part of it. Yeah, no doubt. Speaking of the process and expectations for a position group, you know, and, and every coach is going to come in and they're going to say they got very high expectations for their position group. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the stuff that Furry said today, Chris, not word for word, but very similar when I went on YouTube, as I always do when a, a new name pops up, I started Googling, I started doing YouTube search. What's out there about this guy? And what did I find? I found a 40 minute podcast of Furry from three years ago talking to this page, which is actually a pretty cool young guy called Receiver School. And it was just him talking about his background and his approach to, to receivers and coaching receivers and coaching in general. And then I found from nine years ago him as the receivers coach at Marshall talking about uh, that would have been when Doc Holliday, I guess, was the coach there talking about sort of the uh, the expectations for his receivers at the time. And they had a group that actually was really good on paper coming back. It was preseason. And he was kind of doing the, you know, what how good we are on paper don't mean nothing right now. Like, we've got to go show it. We've got to go do it. But, again, different wording, but it was very similar to what his expectations are for what he said about South Carolina, just in terms of his overall approach and setting those high standards for his group and then sort of trying to push them to live up to that. So this is this is not from nine years ago. This is from about three hours ago. Um, this will be our final clip here. and This is him just talking about the expectations for that group. But uh, I can tell you now that I am completely honored to be the wide receiver coach at, uh, at the University of South Carolina, and I'm honored to be part of the staff. And I told the team yesterday when I first walked in, and I'll never forget this, and some Jordans and jeans and, and a polo and, and a vest, uh, and I got a chance to just talk to the guys in the special teams room that uh, I'm here to help. I'm here to assist. I'm here to develop. Uh, I'm here to push. And uh, I don't see why USC doesn't have the best wide receiver core in the country year in and year out. Uh, we recruit the best players in the country year in and year out, and uh, that should be our standard, and that will be our standard. And uh, that's something that we're going to have to get to work on because development is not, it's not easy. It's not a coach's choice. Development has to be a player's choice first. And uh, as we get to know these guys and <clears throat> their, their, my relationship with them and learn about their backgrounds, learn about where they're from, and learn about their stories, right, and get to know them, uh, we'll start developing these young men. and, and uh, But until then, uh, I'm proud to be here, and I'm proud to be the wide receiver coach here at South Carolina. So uh, best is the standard, I guess, for, for these receivers, Chris. And um, I, I don't know, man. You, you can only take so much from a press conference. Like, we've, we've learned that. We've done enough of these at this point. Um, and, and I do – I want to say this. Sometimes – like we, we get reactions from people on social media, even when I like post stuff about a new coach or post information about that we're hearing about their style and how they operate. It's oh another another home run hire, huh? Um, ultimately, any coaching hire is going to be it's going to be judged by what happens on the field, right? And ultimately, if you're an assistant coach, you can only do your part too. Like you're. You're the success of the overall program. There's a thousand different variables that go into that. But what we're trying to do is give some insight on what we're hearing or what we think on kind of the approach a particular coach is going to take to try and and fix a, a situation. Because generally, if you're being hired, you are you are trying to improve things and tweak things and put your own spin on it. And so, yeah, there there are no guarantees with right. any hire whatsoever. And so, obviously, we're just telling you what we're hearing and what we're being told about a coach's approach. And 
again, this is a guy that's going to come in. I imagine he's going to tell everybody in that room, look, I know you've been through a lot the last couple months. You've had different coaches, but I'm I'm not going to come in here and baby you. I'm going to push you because – and, you know, Travis makes a good point here, man. Every single guy in that room is probably more athletic than Furry, but he played in the NFL and caught almost 100 balls. So that says something about – his knowledge of how to get open, how to make plays, and how to make an impact. And now his job is to impart that wisdom on this group. Yeah, to, to what you were saying earlier, Wes, I do feel like there's people that want us to come on and bash new hires right off the top, which is not fair, right? Because I, I don't know – I think it's almost a straw man sometimes because – I don't. I don't think we've ever gotten on here and said that this hire will work a hundred percent. Like even if we think, with what we say publicly or what we think privately, even if we think a hire is man, that's that's a good hire. We don't sit here and go, that's a guaranteed to work a hundred percent, because you know a lot of hires that have been universally lauded, man, by the you know almost everybody's a great hire doesn't work out. You know there weren't a there weren't a whole lot of people super fired up about Lamont Paris. And now Lamont Paris's approval rating is precisely 100% in Columbia, right? And so you, you just never know. So we're not going to come on here and be like, I don't know, guys, this, this probably ain't going to work. Again, we're going to react to what we heard, analyze what we've heard, talk about strengths of a guy, talk about questions. We've spent part of this show – talking about, hey, what is one of the questions that Mike Curry is going to enter Columbia with? Recruiting, right? Well, we need time to actually analyze that. I can sit here and say he's got the traits for it. I can sit here and say he hasn't done it at this level yet. Th those are both potentially true. Um, we got to see how it goes, right? But I do think I'm, I'm fascinated by the hire. I'm very intrigued by it because of his background, and because I think of some of the traits that he's going to bring to the program, both in development and potentially in recruiting as well. Yeah, no doubt, man. You know who we can absolutely 100% talk positively about? You already know where I'm going. It's our friends at Liberty Tax, 803-462-5576. Hey, man, you don't want to deal with the IRS. You want to make sure your taxes are done right. No, Nobody enjoys doing their taxes. Like, I, I, really, I don't know, maybe – Maybe there's two people out there that do, but nobody else actually enjoys this. So why not do it with somebody, A, where you're supporting a fellow Gamecock, but B, somebody that's going to take care of you, look out for you. Three convenient locations here in the Midlands. Our friends at Liberty Tax, Larry, it's a brighter way to do taxes at 803-462-5576, and we certainly appreciate them being a sponsor. Hey, when, when you call Larry, tell him, Tell them that you heard about them on GC Live because that certainly helps us and it lets him know that by supporting our show that it has been it's been worth it to him. I saw a couple of questions throughout the show, Chris, about baseball and can they play? Will they play today? Short answer, I have no idea. If you're not in Columbia right now, and again, we're recording this, we're live at 249. So if you're hearing this later on or watching it later, it may be completely different by that point. If you're not in Columbia, you may not know this. If you're in Columbia, you know it's been raining all day. So, you know, I know they have a great drainage system there. Matter of fact, they actually dug up the entire field this offseason and put in a new drainage system at Founders Park. So it's, it's the best it's ever been, I, I think, in terms of being able to drain. But – I don't know about you out there at Irmo, but over here near Exit 9, Chris, it it <laughs> rained all night. It's rained all day. Um, it is slowing up right this second. So it doesn't look good. I will say this. If for whatever, if for some reason it moved on, we got a chance of playing some ball. But the interesting thing about this one is you're trying to do something unique. That's play one at Founders, one at Segra, and then one at Doug Kingsmore. And that's – if any one of those games gets thrown off by weather, you almost, I would say, 
you're threatened to lose a game because it's not as easy as just saying, oh, there's supposed to be three at Founders this year. Let's just move move one of those to Saturday and have a doubleheader. You're muted again. I don't think anybody at South Carolina is going to be like, yeah, man, let's let's play a couple in Clemson on Sunday. No, no, not going to go over so well. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been nasty in Irmo for most of the day, Wes. The rain is kind of on and off. Of course, Founders Park is not in Irmo, as you know. And when we were leaving downtown, it was pretty nasty. So, we shall see. I was looking forward to some baseball, some Friday evening baseball, Clemson, Carolina. Great rivalry series. So, I hope we get it in in some form or fashion and are able to get full slate of games in whenever those do happen. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, basketball, uh, men's basketball, big game tomorrow, noon, Florida. If if I, I think they're already in, but if South Carolina wins tomorrow, you got to think that that's just – are we wow. just gonna keep? We're just gonna keep saying that, like they're they're gonna like make it to the finals of the SEC tournament. So not not even have won it yet, but they'll win every game, and we'll be like, I think, I think they're <laughs> not. Nah, well, seriously, I, I mean, they're, I they're, think they're already there. And and to be clear, if the season ended today, they would be a lock to make it. Yes, I'm when I'm saying lock, I'm saying literally, no matter what happens from here on out. They're in. Lose I every to, other game. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to think they're actually already there. But I, I think the – it's like when you're watching the little percentages. I think the percentages go up to 100 yeah. if you if you add another – I mean, it's a, this quad one game actually should stay quad one when South Carolina wins it, Um, I think. Wait, no, 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 no. Let me go ahead and correct myself. This is another borderline quad one game. Okay. Because it's a home game. And uh, Florida's right on the border. Last I checked in the net, 30-31-ish. So it'll be quad one or quad two. The ESPN predictor, which has been off on South Carolina, all year long, it actually has this as a coin flip, Chris. Yep, 50.4%. I think that one flipped after South Carolina beat a and Actually got credit for that win for the first time all year. If I'm Carolina, I would almost rather that thing pointed toward the Gators. Yeah, seriously. South Carolina is still an underdog against Tennessee. And Wes, here's an interesting one. Right now – against Mississippi State on the road. Mississippi State, did, did we determine they are a they're an NCAA tournament team? According right to Minardi right now. Still there. Yeah, Ole Miss is out. Mississippi State is in. A&M is out. That's right. Yeah, so State's still in. Road game, 75% towards Mississippi State right now. Fascinating. But if you're South Carolina, who cares? That's what you've been doing all year. So. That thing loves home teams, though. It does. Loves them. Um, yeah, Florida right now, 34 in the net. So that's that's quad two at this point. Tennessee will definitely be a quad one game. Yes, yes. And um, Mississippi State, because it's on the road, I believe will be quad one. Maybe I can't Should find be. it right now. Anyway, that stuff's fascinating. But all right, y'all. Hope hopefully, hopefully there's a great weekend of sports ahead for South Carolina. And I do know this: Gamecock Central will be there for every step of the way, regardless of when the games are played. We'll we'll have coverage of of every single thing. And uh, then women playing Tennessee on Sunday, of course as we get closer and closer to postseason for both men's and women's basketball and big uh, baseball series as well. So, all right, y'all, we're going to get out of here. Y'all stay dry. Hopefully we get three baseball games, and we'll see y'all next